This is Barry Knapp with Ironsides Macroeconomics. Our report this week, which was a pretty beefy report, um, released on Saturday, August 14th, was titled The Upside Down. It's a reference to the nature of inflation, uh, areas that contributed to inflation for decades uh, are now negatively contributing and goods prices, which have been the source of all disinflation for decades, is now significantly positively contributing, hence the name of the report, The Upside Down. Uh, I'll do my best to be succinct. As I said, this was a very beefy report, um, quite a bit of content in this, in this report. Um, before I get started, though, I'd like to acknowledge what a sad weekend it was. <clears throat> Send my, um, my prayers to the family and friends of my former Sunday morning soccer Haitian teammates, and of course, all the Haitian people, as well as um, the Afghani people. It's nearly 20 years since um, that horrible day, which I had a front row seat for, and it's sad to see the Afghani people now controlled by the Taliban. Um, that's it on that. There were five major components to this week's report. Uh, a section on the markets and what we described as a reflation revival. Performance of a lot of the reflationary sectors improved decidedly, at least until Friday's um, uh, shockingly weak UMISH consumer confidence number. The next section was uh, about the inflation numbers titled upside down inflation. The third section we titled policy pileup and we went through uh, six major upcoming policy related risks to the markets, that, all of which could contribute to a risk off event. The fourth section was titled The Politics of Inflation. We did a bit of an interview with uh, Barron's on this topic. Um, I think it got written about this weekend, though. I'm not sure if we were, I was quoted or not. Uh, and then the um, fifth section was marking to market our call to reduce risk uh, back in June after the June FOMC meeting. So first on the reflation revival, the transitory narrative that was contributed to the rally in rates and certainly the rally in tech stocks through the better part of the second quarter and even into the beginning of the third quarter seems to be falling apart about midway through the third quarter. Um, we would describe it as falling apart due to both secular and cyclical factors. The Delta variant, we think, is a much bigger inflation risk than it is growth risk. Um, shutting of Chinese ports underscores how our dependency on China for global supply chains is a problem in the short term, and it's going to be a problem in the long term. We are going to move away from that. That uh, does imply that the decades of um, negative contributions from good, goods prices, index CPI, and PCED uh, is, is very likely done uh, for good. Um, as a consequence, you've started to see the reflationary sectors act much better. We think that's likely to persist at least until the point when we have a, um, what we've been describing as Fed policy normalization related correction. And then that we believe will be a fairly highly correlated sell-off. <clears throat> However, on the other side of that, we do expect those reflationary sectors to continue to be the best performers. And that's where we suggest you should uh, continue to be allocated towards. As far as the inflation outlook goes, um, goods prices are increasing at a three and a half, or excuse me, an eight and a half percent annualized rate after negatively contributing for decades, as we said. Um, and uh, any uh, comfort the market had from the slightly weaker than expected core CPI number was quickly reversed after PPI. Uh, printed a 7.8% annualized rate. Interestingly, that's about the same rate that the Chinese PPI, uh, manufacturing PPI is running out of 7.5%. We are importing inflation from China now, unlike uh, um, the period for, uh, for decades. And for years, investors became accustomed to ignoring PPI because rarely did you have pass-through. If U.S. manufacturing costs went up, they were unable to pass it through to the consumer primarily because they could source those products in other places more cheaply. That's no longer the case. So PPI, we think, is going to be a much more important indicator on a go-forward basis. Moving from that goods price um, dynamic onto the, what we've been describing as the deadweight sectors, that is housing, healthcare, and education, 
The reason we call them the deadweight sectors is because they've been taking an increasing amount of GDP for the better part of four decades, yet their prices have continuously run above the broad aggregates like the headline CPI number or headline PCED number. And this implies that they're very, they're negative contributors to productivity. And in fact, there was a Gallup report that we sent the link to, put the link to in our report this week from 2016, where the Gallup chief economist concluded that they were the major sources of slow productivity growth uh, over the course of a couple of decades. We don't think that that deflation in those sectors is going to persist. Service sector inflation is up to 2.9%. It's run above three for decades. Those housing numbers are on their way up. Some of the OER, owner's equivalent rent measures, still look quite weak. Medical care is being held back partially by price controls or threat for price controls. We know how well that worked out in the 70s. Um, and education costs have been falling, particularly for higher education. We don't think that's going to uh, last either, particularly not if you grant more student loan debt forgiveness, then neither students or universities have any skin in the game. And that can only imply one thing, which is significantly higher prices over time. Um, so we think the, the inflation is uh, is going to head higher. We may very well have hit peak, but it's not going back to one and a half percent for core PCED in our view. Now, as far as this policy pileup dynamic goes, um, we've identified uh, six major potential sources of policy-related risk in the coming months, really in particular, once we get after uh, get past Labor Day. First of all, the Democratic budget that was passed in the Senate um, was really just a statement of intent, but it allows for an additional 1.75 trillion expansion in the budget deficit. Given the scoring from the CBO and some of the independent uh, policy think tanks, the infrastructure bill will likely expand the deficit by 250. So that's 2 trillion on top of the 1.9 trillion earlier this year, all in, since the beginning of uh, the pandemic, the government spent about 41% of GDP. This is World War II level spending. And we do think the back end, long end of the treasury market is going to wake up to this dynamic as it becomes clear that the, um, there's going to be another big expansion of the, uh, the deficit and more importantly, expansion of government spending, which um, is a big crowding out risk. Uh, corporate tax hikes. We'd sort of taken those off the radar screen for some time. As currently constructed, it's worth at least 5 to 8% off of earnings growth. We put a link to a very good tax foundation report about the implications of the international tax hikes, how uncompetitive that'll make us, and how uh, inversions will likely reemerge. Next issue is the capital gains hikes. Um, our analysis of this back in 2010 argued when the capital gains uh, tax rate was about to double that that was worth one multiple point. Again, that's a 5% move in the S&P 500. There's a risk, another risk. The debt ceiling, um, the Democrats will no doubt try and combine that with a spending bill, stopgap spending bill at the end of September. The Republican narrative for the next midterm elections is that Democrats are spending recklessly and we tried to stay in the way and not let them borrow more money. We, uh, there is a probability of a crack up. Now, this will not have any macroeconomic fallout of two prior government shutdowns, one at the end of 95 with Clinton Gingrich and the one in 2013 with Obama and Boehner did cause a 4.1, 4.2% sell-off in the S&P, just a little risk-off shock, but it had no macroeconomic fallout, even for those Keynesians who really looked hard for it. Still though, a risk to the markets and market psychology. Uh, number five is the Fed tapering and continuing claims continue to, from the redundant school of redundancy, continue to plunge. And we think a, another strong report is uh, highly likely at this point, meaning that the Fed will have reached their substantial progress um, hurdle for the labor market. And we still think September is more probable than not. And then finally, the draining of the Treasury general account process that's complete. So six major policy risks. Um, in a lot of ways, this lines up similarly to 2011 when we had a tightening of fiscal and monetary policy. Theoretically, we could have fiscal policy expanding with the additional spending. But if you hike corporate taxes at the same time as you um, the Fed starts tapering, that will be similar to 2011. And that was the biggest drawdown of the entire last business cycle. S&P went down 19%. It's not our call, 
but uh, but that's one way to think about the potential risks of all these policy uh, policy tightening that uh, could occur this fall. We wrote a section on the politics of inflation. We won't spend too much time on this other than certainly the University of Michigan consumer sentiment number was a manifestation of that. Inflation is becoming one of the main public concerns. Right track, wrong track polling is going the wrong way for the Democrats at this point. President uh, Biden's polling on his handling of the economy is going the wrong way. Could be some good and some bad out of that as well. It could act as a reflexivity that prevents some of the worst case scenarios in terms of excessive government spending, expansion of the social welfare state and uh, battles over the debt ceiling and the like. It also increases the probability of Powell being reappointed. So again, that could probably be a good thing, all things equal. Um, the final section of the note this week was what we called our marking to market. So since we made that call in June to reduce risk, generally, if you reduced your positions by roughly 15%, as we were inferring, and we did, um, the S&P has rallied 5%, so you left about 80 basis points on the table. So that wasn't uh, a super timely call. Some of our sector calls around that about how we suggested reducing risk and where you should be positioned worked out much better. We suggested cutting uh, emerging market risk. That's massively underperformed. Cutting small cap exposure, that's negative over that time period as well. We, we suggested staying long financials. They've significantly outperformed. We said to stick with your market weight in tech. That's marginally outperformed. Uh, we said to stay, cut uh, industrials a little bit, but still stay generally overweight them. They've underperformed by 150 basis points or so. No big, uh, no big impact on portfolio performance there. We did suggest staying long energy. That's performed very poorly. So that was our worst call, but it's a small portion of the S&P 500. We never suggested being all in on energy, just being marginally overweighted. So it didn't hurt portfolio performance all that much. And we still like these sectors. One other additional sector I neglected to mention, which was an upgrade of healthcare in July when we put out our third or second half outlook note. And that one's marginally ahead of the S&P 500. So, so far, uh, it's, it's not a bad call. So all in all, we still like being long these reflation sectors, industrials, financials. Um, we took materials to a market weight for now, stay market weight tech and stay overweight energy. I think the energy story is gonna get better, but we do still think that this risk off event is coming and um, we're gonna get the minutes of the FOMC meeting this week. We're going to get Jackson Hole the following week and um, keep watching those claims numbers because if continuing claims fall at the rate they're currently falling, we're going to have another big print in August. And there's really going to be no defense from the doves on the Fed to not start slowing those asset purchases. So uh, I apologize if this was a bit long this week, but as I said, it was a very meaty report. Barry Knapp, Ironsides Macro. Have a good week, everyone. Thanks.